want you to know that I come to you this morning, not just as a theology professor, but as Logan said, as the husband of Donna of now 31 years. I have a photograph of my family that I'd like to show you. They are wonderful. My wife is a brilliant, good, patient, kind, gracious, funny, interesting, curious, amazing woman. I'm so grateful. She's actually here. Donna, would you stand up and wave to everyone? <laughs> Donna. I, I'm quite, I, I can be a complete idiot, but I would be way more of an idiot if it weren't for my wife's constant influence in my life. She is my primary daily source of the grace of God in my life. I'm so grateful for her. And I, my, da- my daughter Caroline, my daughter Paige, my son Sam, and my son, son Isaac are also a great delight to my life. I show you this picture because I want you to know, sometimes I remember seeing one of my elementary school teachers one time in the grocery store. And I was shocked. I thought, teachers go to the grocery store and they eat? And I saw one of, the, one of my, my teachers, he was, he was in the men's room with, with me. And I just couldn't believe that teachers were real people. And I know you're past that. It's not elementary school. But there still can be this perception that your profs are so much further down the road than you in some ways that you can't really relate to them. But please know, we are in this with all of you as much as we can be. As we seek to be faithful disciples of Jesus, as we seek to live out our discipleship as fathers and as husbands and as sheep among the flocks at our church as I am at Grace Evangelical Free Church as well as one of the pastors here in La Mirada, I just want you to know that everything I say this morning to you is something I am seeking to apply to my own heart. I'm so grateful for the worship team. They couldn't, thank you friends, you could not have gotten us going in a better direction than where we're heading with the lyrics, with the music. It was just beautiful. I'm so grateful. Well, I want to dive into a passage that's going to help us frame our entire lives. It's going to help us think about uh, being tired after an all-nighter, as we we mentioned. It's going to help us think about what it means to be good stewards of our education. It's going to help us think about our future aspirations. It's going to help us think about a hero who has suddenly died tragically this week along with eight other dear souls. It's going to help us think about everything in our lives because it's about the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And he, and that he is risen, changes everything. That becomes the reality of our lives. My dear friend and colleague here at Biola, John Lundy, he he told me recently that, and other students have been in his office have told me recently that no matter what he's talking about these days, whether it's a student's eating disorder or pornography problem or family troubles or financial battles, he's starting every counseling session with this question. Do you believe that Jesus has risen from the dead? See, if we say yes to that question, everything is now infused with the answer to that question. And as we were just singing, I hope you pay close close attention to the lyrics you're singing, but we were just singing that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And if you really believe that, there's no obstacle, there's no enemy, there's no challenge, there's no crisis, there's no anxiety, there's no despair or depression, there's no temptation that can overtake you because the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's really true. And you may feel like a mere earthling most of the time, but you need to know that if you've been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit through the good news of Christ, died in your place and risen from the dead, everything's different. And life feels mundane most of the time. But it's anything but. It's always intersecting with the things of eternity and the advancement of the kingdom of our Messiah, who's risen from the dead. Do you believe that this morning? I'm not convinced (laughs) at all. Uh, Would you open your Bibles, please, to Luke 24? Because I want you to believe that so much that it infuses, this truth infuses itself into every corner of your life without exception. Luke chapter 24, we'll pick it up beginning at verse 13. This is that well-known story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. It's the day we celebrate on Easter morning. 
It's this glorious day where Jesus conquered sin and death and hell and he meets two of his disciples who don't know that yet, but we do. And let's pick our story up in Luke 24, beginning of verse 13. Here we go. You ready? That very day, resurrection morning, the day everything changed, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Oh, this is great. Anybody who thinks the Bible's boring must not have ever read it. It's anything but this is a great story. This is like a, a, a suspense novel or, or a detective story where we are led in on the crime or the event and we watch the people we're watching discover what we're, or we already know. That's really fun and that's the, the way this story's going down here. And we, we have to ask, well, why wouldn't Jesus immediately let them know that it was him? Why would God, and that's what I believe is going on here, God is preventing them from immediately knowing. Now, Jesus was different in his resurrected state, but he was recognizable as well. Other disciples recognized him. Why were their eyes kept from recognizing him? We'll find out. Watch, watch, watch. While they were talking, Jesus drew near, and their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17, he said to them, what is this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Oh, I love that. You know what? That, that's me so often. I know that's you so often. We're in the very presence of the risen Lord, our savior, the one who couldn't have drawn nearer to us than he has. All our answers are found in him. All our solutions are found in him and he's with us. As Logan said, he's with us right now, but we're still sad. We, we're not grabbing hold of that truth. They're sad. And listen to their answer. Then one of them, verse 18, named Cleopas. Now, Cleopas was actually a na the name of, of Jesus' uncle, who was married to his Aunt Mary. He had an Aunt Mary as well as a Mother Mary. And this very well may be not just two followers of Jesus, but this may be Jesus' aunt and uncle. It's possible. And, and so this disciple named Cleopas answers him. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened there in these days? Come on, that's funny. Jesus has risen from the dead and they say, what do you live under a rock? Have you never heard about Jesus and what's been going on about him? And they're talking to Jesus. That's funny. Come on. And, and, and Jesus says, I love these two words. What things? Does he ask that question because he doesn't know what the things are? No, he is the things. He knows the things. What's he doing? He's doing what God does for us out of his kindness. He gets right down on our level and he says, talk to me. Remind yourself about these things. They haven't come home to you like they need to, so recount them one more time to me. Jesus isn't asking for information he lacks. He's asking them to rehearse one more time the things they've seen regarding him. You know, that's what we do at Biola. You know, if you're raised in a Christian home, some of you went to Christian schools and went to church your whole life, a lot of the time at Bible, we're not telling you new stuff. What are we doing? We're reminding you of really old stuff that's still as true as it's ever been and still as life-changing as it ever has been. And so Jesus says, what things? Like a good father or mother gets on her knee and says, honey, I see flour all over the kitchen to the three-year-old girl. Honey, did something happen to the flour? 
it's not because the mom doesn't know. She's just working with this child right where she is, right? He says, what things? And listen to what they say. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Pause right there. What tense is the verb in that sentence? What's the tense of the verb in that sentence? Past. We had hoped in him. It seems their hope has dissipated or is gone. And again, he's right there with them as much as he can be. But their hope is past tense. Christian, you should never live in past tense hope. Because Jesus is present and your hope should be always present as well. We had hoped, but now we don't know. And they say yes, and beside all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women on our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, foolish ones, <laughs> and slow to, of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then listen to this. And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Oh, to have been there. Oh, why didn't God inspire the writers of scripture to write down that sermon? Maybe because no preacher would ever feel like they could preach again, right? <laughs> well, we'll preach a sermon. No, just read that. But no, we don't know the sermon word for word, but we can surmise as we'll talk about in a bit. Then what happens, verse 28. So they drew near to the village which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, that slide, Jesus. <laughs> Always working with him, right? But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, listen to this. He took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then, maybe, maybe because that act made them remember the last supper he had with them where he did that very same thing. Maybe as he handed them the bread, they saw the nail scars in his hands but most certainly because God said to the Holy Spirit, now. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is an awesome story, come on. And he vanished from their sight. It gets even better. <laughs> this is so great. They said to each other, where did he go? Bummer, just as things were getting good, he leaves. No, it's so interesting, they don't say that. Just when we figure it out, he's gone. Oh, come on. No, no, they seem to be incredibly blessed and satisfied, even though Jesus disappears from their midst. And why? Because look at the, res the result of his presence with them. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Oh, come on. We should just stop right now and worship God and pray. This is phenomenal. Here are a few things I want you to really make sure you get out of this passage. The first thing is Jesus is alive. Like I said when I was starting, Jesus is alive. Jesus really has risen from the dead. 
Jesus really has conquered sin and death and hell. He has really done that. And he's unlike any other religious leader because of that. Because uh, the, the Buddha is in the, in the grave. Muhammad's in the grave. Uh, all the great political religious leaders of history are in the grave and if they're not yet, they will be. Not Jesus, Jesus is alive. And Jesus then has the authority over sin and death and hell and punishment and Satan to rule and reign and conquer as he does. This resurrection was foretold throughout the Old Testament. There's abundant historical evidence for it. There really aren't good reasons to believe that Jesus didn't rise from the dead unless you just assume for some reason those things just don't happen. The history of the church is a 2,000 years testimony of the reality of the resurrection. They would have stayed cowards hiding in a corner, completely discouraged if Jesus didn't reveal himself as risen from the dead. And here's what you need to know. Luke ends his gospel with the ascension, not the resurrection. And he begins the book of Acts with the ascension, not the resurrection, which means Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and is living now as the God-man interceding for us as we desperately need him to every day, applying the perfectly sufficient work he did for us in his life and death every minute of every day. That's the good news of Jesus as our great high priest. He's at the right hand of the Father ruling and reigning and he's coming back one day. That's what the ascension assures for us. That's why it's in every creed in the history of the church of any import, including Biola's statement of faith. He rose and he ascended as well. And he's our risen Lord. So the first thing, we serve a risen Savior, a living God. And as we said, that power that raised Jesus from the dead is what rose you from the dead when you became a new creature in Christ by faith in Jesus. And this means he won. He won. And his sacrifice is sufficient. Romans 6.5 puts it this way, if we've, we've been united with him in his death, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We are assured eternal life. And when Jesus said it's finished, he really meant it. The second thing I want you to make sure you know is we know Christ according to the scriptures. I love this story because it's so affirming of what we're doing here at Biola. I mean, think about this. The risen Lord moseys up to his disciples on the road to Emmaus and he wants to reveal himself to them, but he wants to do it in a way that will set the precedent of the way they will be with him for the rest of history until he returns again. Now, think about this. How does he do it? Well, I know how I would have done it if I were Jesus, and let's all pause and thank God that I'm not. Because the way I would have done it, I would have been so excited about my, maybe my relatives, but my followers, that they were sad, they were discouraged, they were despondent. And, and I would want them to know they didn't need to be. I'm alive. And that's what I would have done. I would have come sprinting down the road to Emmaus to them. No, I would have just poof, appeared in their midst. And I would have said, I'm alive. You don't believe it? Watch, stones to bread. Right? I would have said, oh, you still don't believe it. Uh, I'll find a blind man. I'll make you blind and then make you see. Pow! And I'll fix that and I'll, I'll do miracles. I'll, I'll, I'll call down angels from heaven. No, Jesus doesn't do any of that. How does Jesus reveal his risen reality to them? He has a Bible study. He has a Bible study. He did what we're actually doing right now. He did what we do in our classes when we open the word or in the residence halls when we open the word or anytime in our local churches we open the word when we gather on a road trip and open the word and dig into it. That's Jesus' method of revealing himself to us, of being with us and us with him. A Bible study that can feel so rote, mechanical, clinical, academic, but it's anything but. Did, did you see it? Did you see how he reveals himself? Look at verse 27. Don't miss it. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. And then when they reflect on meeting him, they reflect on, yes, breaking the bread, no doubt a foreshadowing to the Lord's Supper. But they also reflect on what? That he met them in verse 32 and did what? Opened to us the scriptures. How encouraging is that? 
that when we dive into the word, we're actually following the method of being with Jesus that Jesus himself used when he wanted to reveal himself to the disciples. He didn't want them to depend on these miraculous displays. Just like he didn't depend on miraculous displays when he was representing us in the Mount of Temptation and Satan was tempting him. Does he turn Satan to bread or stone? Does he knock him off the cliff with a, off the cliff with a blast of his divine glory? No, what does he do? What does he do? He quotes the word, exactly. He quotes scripture. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He applied the scriptures in his own life. When people challenged him, what was his question all the time? Have you not read? Have you not read? Don't you need a Bible, you Pharisee? Yeah, he's saying that to them. Have you not read the scriptures are the anchor of his ministry and they become the means by which we are with him? Now there is a spirit-enabled, supernatural, subjective element at work powerfully when we open the word, but we don't get to that without the word as our anchor. And it's been said we need the word of God as our rudder of the ship and the sails of the spirit's reception unfurled fully as God moves us as disciples. And so we know Jesus in the breaking of the bread and according to the scriptures. We are with Jesus when we're with the word. Let's not forget that. And I know it might not feel that way to you. That you read your Bible, hopefully this morning you did, got up a little early, read your Bible, got on your knees and you prayed. And I hope even if it didn't feel very important or supernatural, you trust that Jesus' method of being with him is what you just employed this morning. And every time you become a man or woman of the word in that sort of way. And, and this actually mirrors other sermons by Jesus. Look at John 5, what Jesus himself says. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The scriptures are all about me, he says. Uh, look at this passage, this next one. In Acts 10, Peter says to Cornelius, to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here's something really important then. We know Christ according to the scriptures. We uh, are with Christ according to the scriptures as the spirit works. But here's another thing. We know the scriptures according to Christ. We know the scriptures according to Christ. To really understand the Bible, you need to understand it the way Jesus does, as all pointing to him. Not necessarily in some allegorical uh, one-to-one correspondence, but, but clearly when we read the Bible, we need to be saying, how does this point me to Jesus? Either my need for Jesus or my fulfillment of Jesus. You know, when they come, these two, into the room with the other disciples, as our passage shows us in the conclusion, See verse 33, they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then I think the two on the road cut them off and say, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. He was known to them. Imagine how they recounted this experience they had had. He said, he opened the scriptures to us. And we were with him and our hearts burned when we were and he opened the scriptures. And now we understand the scriptures like we never had. We understand Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was there, you know. He was there. And now we understand Genesis 3 like we never have before. When God promised the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent and solve our sin problem once and for all, he's that seed. We understand the exodus now when the blood of the lamb is put on the doorpost and the angel of death passes over. That blood of the lamb is a foreshadowing of him. We understand the brazen serpent, that bronze serpent, if they looked on it and had been bitten by a snake, they wouldn't die. That's pointing to Jesus. We understand the lamb that was sacrificed over and over again because he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We understand all the priests and all the kings, and all the prophets like we never had before because Jesus fulfilled all of those offices before him. And we understand two passages of scripture we've never understood before. You know how we've always had a hard time understanding how Jesus could be, how the Messiah could be both the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, 
Like a lamb led to a slaughter who opened, doesn't open his mouth. And how the Messiah at the same time could be the Daniel 7 Messiah who's ruling and reigning and coming in the clouds of heaven worshiped by the nations. Well, we understand that now because the first time he came, he's that suffering servant. The next time he comes, he's coming as the king and judge of the world. We understand Jesus according to the scriptures, but we understand the scriptures according to Jesus. A couple more points. God transforms us through the scriptures. Knowledge of scriptures transforms our hearts and our affections and our actions and heart change, le change leads to passion for Christ and impact for Christ. What happens after this is they preach the gospel from the word and 3,000 people come to Christ in the same city where no doubt a lot of those 3,000 were screaming just days before, crucify him. And now they're bowing the knee to Jesus. And this, this motley crew, this, this amazing collection of, of disciples turn the world upside down. And so can we when the Spirit transforms us. Last point I want you to realize is this. It's ultimately God who seeks and saves the lost. I love how this ends. I read this passage numerous times before I ever noticed this one little phrase. What the disciples say, I believe, to the two when they come into the room, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. He's appeared to Simon. Who's Simon? Simon Peter. Simon Peter. He, he went and found, apparently, before he talked to the other disciples, Peter, the one who denied him. And you know it wasn't to say, how could you? Get out of my sight, you disgust me. No. He no doubt said, Peter, I'm alive. It's all going to be okay. Come on back home. You're forgiven. And that's what he's saying to you today if you've been walking away from him. Look, I, I can seem like I've lost my mind when I teach. <laughs> but it's because I believe every single day we open the word together. We're doing divorce prevention. I believe we're putting pornography to death. We're, we're, we're killing off sin. We're being transformed into ministers of reconciliation and justice in our world. We're becoming the salt and the light that the world desperately needs. We are getting ready for warfare when we gather like this. We're not fulfilling chapel credits. We're not fulfilling requirements for graduation primarily. We're doing that too, yeah. But what are we doing? We're getting ready for war. We're diving into the stuff of our faith, the stuff of our hope. Nothing breaks my heart more than when Biola grads who know so much don't live according to what they know. And nothing brings my heart greater delight than when they do. The past few months, I have seen one of the most powerful displays of Biola grads living according to what they know. Their names are Mike and Karen Cleary, and they graduated from Iola in 2002. And this is a picture of Mike and Karen and their family. They were just amazing when they were here. They were godly. Their parents had raised them to know and love the Lord. And Mike and Karen came here, and Mike was a musician, and Karen was a star soccer player. And they just had a wonderful impact as ministers of the gospel. And they, they, we took the handoff from their parents here at Biola, and we helped them go even deeper and get anchored in their faith. And then they've stayed involved in the church since they graduated in 2002. And they, they raised a beautiful family of three children. And then back in October... In the middle of the night, they had to take their son to the ER, and just hours later, they found out that he had leukemia. And this is Mike and Karen at Jack's funeral. Just a few days later, their little boy Jack, the one on your left, eight years old. And, and Don and I had the privilege of going to that memorial service and seeing their brokenheartedness, but seeing their lives anchored in the truth of the gospel. And at Jack's service, Karen got up and spoke, and Mike got up and spoke, and they told us about their boy, and how much they loved him, and how much hope they had in the midst of their grief, and then Mike led us in worship. Now why? 
Why? How? How could they possibly do this? Are they stuffing their grief? Not at all. Are they just role playing in spite of how they really feel? No, their lives are anchored in what they believe. I want to read you what Karen read at the funeral after Mike led us in worship. This is Mike and Karen walking out of the hospital without their boy. I want to read you what Karen wrote. She used to sit in these seats, and Mike used to sit in these seats, and what they did here, and what they did before here and after here, prepared them for this moment. Are you ready for this moment? Listen to what Karen said at the memorial service. Jack was diagnosed with leukemia on Wednesday, October 2nd. Five short weeks later, on Wednesday, November 6th, he took his last breath and went home to be with Jesus. Listen to what she says, the Bible tells us that the earth is not our home and then we should wait with eager anticipation for Christ's return and to be honest my whole life I've always struggled with that I had a good life overall and I've experienced justice and goodness but it's so apparent to me now that this is not our home that's why we experience so much pain and struggle I cannot wait for heaven where there's going to be no more suffering or sickness or pain I cannot wait to hold Jack again While I'm here, these verses are how I picture heaven now. In Matthew, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fail because it had its foundation on the rock. Friends, my heart is broken. I miss Jack so much, I feel as if my arm is torn off, but I'm not standing on Jack. My feet are on Jesus. And even though it feels like there's a hurricane around me, I am buffeted in every direction, I'm not completely overwhelmed. My feet have a solid surface that cannot be shaken. I have peace amidst a very painful storm and not by my own strength or because I'm strong, but because of God's mercy on me. It's in our own weakness that he is strong. Psalm 62 says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my rock and my refuge. Dear ones, in your time here, you're not just getting ready for graduation. You're getting ready for moments like this, that, that as they walk out of the hospital. Can we show that picture again? Just leave it up there, please. That's what we're getting ready for. That's what, and it won't look just like this for you, many of you. For some of you, these sorts of things. We're getting you ready for miscarriage here. We're getting ready for tragedy. We're getting ready for that amazing promotion or job to help you not be arrogant when that happens. We're helping you with the victories, getting ready for that, the tragedies, all of it, because we are about the stuff of our life here. Our faith, our hope, our joy, our perseverance, because Jesus is alive. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.